hello to everyone who's downloaded this uh, video clip. We're here today as a result of a Zoom meeting which took place last week where uh, Kevin Erasmus, who's a um, legal advisor specifically focusing on occupational health and safety, and his company is called Universality. He raised some, some fairly profound issues around uh, legislation and gave us some tips and uh, guidelines and ideas of what you need to do to ensure our compliance specific on the health and safety. So I'm going to be asking Kevin a few questions and then afterwards, please feel free to contact. I'll ask Kevin just to share his email address at the end. Maybe you can contact Kev directly with any more specific queries that you may have regarding the subject that we're going to be talking about. So Kev, we're talking about health and safety. We're talking about it in the context of, of, um, of uh, the situation we find ourselves in. Let's start off by asking what the core health and safety legislation that we as an industry have to align with during this pandemic. Hi, Jeff. Thank you. Uh, thank you for the opportunity. And uh, I'm gonna get right into your question. There's something that I've seen is that there is a lot of confusion as to what we should take into consideration and trying to comply with this whole pandemic. There's, there's two sides of this whole thing, one being our moral obligations and the second one being our legal obligations. My discussion here would be based on the legal obligations as it is stipulated within the Occupational Health and Safety Act. And that would be our core legislation that we have to go to. Mm. The Occupational Health and Safety Act, what it does, it acts as an umbrella for health and safety compliance in our country. That legislation being promulgated in 1993 did not accommodate all health and safety related risks and uh, issues that may arise within the future. So what they did was the, the legislator, uh, throughout the years, as things became more applicable, they started to draft regulations to slot into the Occupational Health and Safety Act. Then we got to a point in 2001 where they drafted the Hazardous Biological Agent Regulations. That Hazardous Biological Agent Regulations in its annexure B, it has a column or where they list all the viruses that we have to take into consideration when assessing possible health issues uh, or exposures to hazardous biological agents within the workplace. In 2001, they already identified Corona Viridae as a virus that we have to take into consideration. There's two sides to that again. It's, uh, it's companies usually as laboratories that, uh, that deliberately work with these hazardous biological agents. And then the other side are, uh, this is also drafted for employers that you know, at some time during the, the scope of their work might get into contact with a hazardous biological agent. And we're gonna focus on that. And, and that, that, the hazardous biological agent regulations would then form the core uh, focus of, of today's discussion as well. And this is the thing that we have to start off with. So to answer your question, the legislation that we have to take into consideration here be the hazardous biological agent regulations of 2001. Okay, I've got that. That's loud and clear. So we have, we have the Act on one hand, and that Act allows the regulators to draft regulations as they are specific to different elements. And the one you're speaking about is specific to um, um, substances where you even mentioned that Corona was even mentioned uh, way, way back then. So the second question I have for you is, are we then as a homeowners association responsible for managing uh, the exposure of um, homeowners, our own staff, residents, visitors, contractors, service providers? Are we responsible for the exposure of these different stakeholders to the COVID-19 virus? Good. To answer that question, I'm going to start off with Section 8 that clearly stipulates that we as an employer has a legal duty to ensure 
the health and safety of our employees. That's stipulated within Section 8. So in terms of our employees, yes, we do have a clear instruction written within the law to ensure that our employees are not exposed to this virus in this case. In terms of visitors, we can take a look at Section 9 of the Occupational Health and Safety Act that then stipulates that we as employers have a general duty towards people other than those who may be our employees, that means it's visitors. Further on, it goes to say in Section 37 that um, even those mandatories, which is just a fancy word for contractors and service providers, we will also be held responsible for compliance for and on behalf of such mandatories or such contractors, unless we have written agreements and policies and procedures in place with those service providers or contractors uh, that states the responsibility is carried over onto them. Okay. But if you take a clear look at the Act, it clearly stipulates that we as an employer have a duty to work any person, all right, on a premises under our control. Okay. So if any person out there comes onto an estate, walks onto our, through our access control gates, our turnstiles, he gets scanned, he makes use of the uh, clubhouse, any other facilities within the common areas. If a person gets exposed to this virus within one of those areas where we have control over, we being the state, we will be seen as a, as a party that had the responsibility to ensure that people are not exposed to that virus. So we have to take steps. So that covers the employee, that covers our visitors and that covers our service providers. The last thing here that I see um, would be our homeowners. The, mo the moment that a homeowner enters his own home and that home on its own is also seen as a, a company on its own. If people working there, it's being maintained. In essence, it's actually being maintained as a company. Because there's maintenance being done, uh, it's cleaning. So the, the moment that those employees working at a home and those um, homeowners are on that site, um, we would see to it that uh, that 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 homeowner ensures compliance for and behalf of himself and his employees working on that site. Between the gate and that home, that would be our responsibility. Got that. They yeah, are got that, and that makes an awful amount of sense. So you mentioned a number of times uh, we would have to take the steps. We would have to take the steps. Briefly, what are some of those steps that we would need to take? to ensure that we are compliant with the said legislation that you mentioned. Okay. The, I'm just going to scroll down to the hazardous biological agent regulations. Um, it says, okay, regulation six within the hazardous biological agent regulations stipulates the importance of a risk assessment that should be conducted by an employer. And it says that an employer or any self-employed person uh, should ensure or cause a risk assessment to be made and thereafter at intervals not exceeding two years determine if any person might be exposed to hazardous biological agent regulation. What it says here is the first thing that the law requires of you as an employer would be to go and conduct the risk assessment. Within that risk assessment, you would determine all the areas where exposure, you know, people might be exposed. And in this case, exposure to the coronavirus virus, which is the group oh. virus. So in other words, the areas would be your clubhouse or your jungle gyms or your parks. Yes. What, exactly. So what I, what I would recommend people do is they start off by virtually in their heads going, uh, you know, entering the estate and taking a look around them and observing what areas are the areas that people might be exposed to the virus and they should go through the whole estate and identify where do people touch where might people be exposed to, to droplets to uh, uh, you know what's the areas of exposure throughout the whole estate and list that down within your risk assessment okay good 
after after that risk assessment has been conducted they then require that you implement certain mitigation procedures or what we talk about is usually the the control measures that you have to put in place to ensure that the risks that you have been that has been identified will now be properly mitigated yeah so yes that would be the second step as soon as that is completed and all the mitigation uh, procedures have been developed you should then carry that over into documentation that would serve as training documentation and then embark on the journey where you would go about in ensuring that all of your employees and all of the persons that may be exposed to that virus in an area under your control are informed and trained on, on the procedures that you are implementing and what they should do to contribute uh, in or assist in ensuring that the the risk attached to this virus is properly mitigated. Okay, cool. So I suspect the um, answer to the next question I'm going to pose would include what you briefly touched on during our Zoom meetings. Uh, in fact, you didn't briefly, you mentioned a number of times this notion of the importance of establishing a committee. So maybe the answer will come out in the, in the following question, which is, all right, so where do I start? How do I enter this journey of compliance? What's the first steps? So, so I understand this notion of doing the assessment, of identifying all the factors and the remedies and the solutions. Where do we start from here? You know, um, I know you can help organizations with that risk assessment. I know that you will send them as much information as they can. That we know. Where, where do I start? What's the start of this journey for me? I would advise the, the normal estate, the general estate out there, to start off with a blank document, either a Word document or an Excel document. They go and copy the whole act and paste it into that document. From the top, they start highlighting which uh, of those stipulations made within the hazardous biological re uh, regulations are applicable to their organization that would enable you to sift through the things that are not applicable that does not clearly uh, have a have an instruction to you as an employer to sift through those things and identify what we should do and what we shouldn't do and then start by uh, you know planning from the top to the bottom which ones are we going to uh, take on first? The first thing that you would then observe within such a document would be to develop a committee. And they talk about a health and safety committee um, and that you have to consult with this health and safety committee. You can even establish another committee, which would be the COVID-19 uh, committee, health and safety committee for your organization. That committee and the information that they provide during those committee meetings would form the credibility and of such a risk assessment. They are the ones that are responsible for populating the risk assessment and identifying the, the mitigation procedures. So that's step number one. Get, get a document, list everything. Then you establish a committee. Thirdly would then be to go to sec, uh, regulation six, as I have identified, uh, do a risk assessment, but do it within that committee. After you have done those three steps, you will now have determined what mitigation procedures you should include. And a lot of people go about and uh, taking every news article into consideration that they see on Facebook, social media, and, and it's like driving a car, but you do not know why are you driving a car. Mm. So I, I think people should rather take that effort that they they put into reading every news article out there and, and just focus primarily on this as it is biological agent regulations because in annex c within that regulations it clearly gives us an instruction for workplaces on how to prevent a virus spreading and 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 what we should do um i have seen in the last four or five weeks there's no company out there currently in South Africa that I know of 
that have taken that into consideration. Okay. If you ask them what what's the duties that you guys have to comply with, they will send you 30 to 40 documents that they've got from 40 to 50 sources yeah. and they do not know what they're doing. That's so true. They do not know what they and and I almost got stuck in that and and that same groove where where you you I mean you get into that rabbit hole and it's the one after the other and and, and as soon as it, as you see that wow I mean you you do not know where, where you're going and you don't actually know where you started off and that's when I said listen let's let's regroup let's regroup let's focus on the hazardous biological agent regulations and the things that has been given to us I mean this virus and the family that it belongs to is not something new you clearly see that within the the that it is biological agent regulations. It's been there since 2001. So there's no question, listening to you um, and listening to the president every time he addresses us, there's no question that he's going to rely on enforcers of the of the law. We, we, we know that. Uh, I haven't seen enforcement of a particular act like I've seen with the Disaster Management Act and when uh, lockdown finishes and we're all back, I'm convinced that he's just going to step up. And with all of that comes penalties and fines and stuff. Uh, without getting into great detail about each and every offence, give us an idea of what those penalties and fines that could be attached to non-compliance, Okay. okay. So non-compliance uh, clearly gets stipulated within hazardous biological agent regulation 18 it says any person who contravenes or fails to comply with any provision of regulation 3 to 17 now 3 to 7 a summary of thereof would be the development of a committee the risk assessment the mitigation procedures the control procedures the records that you must keep because these records of compliance to the hazardous biological agent regulations should be kept for 40 years 40, 40 years, years within your company so 40 for zero years um failure to render proof thereof would uh, like they say here would be uh that person would be liable on conviction to a fine or to imprisonment for a period not exceeding 12 months so we should not only look at uh, regulation 18 here we should also look at um at the penalties and fines imposed on on an employer in terms of section 38 of the occupational health and safety act which are, are much higher uh, fines, penalties and fines, imprisonment up to two years. So failure to comply with this will inevitably have that as a consequence. We should also take note of the, the legislation like the Disaster Management Act that's being implemented now, is it being implemented by government to ensure compliance on their behalf, to take care of our uh, health and safety because we all have a right to a healthy and a safe environment. We should know that the duty that's imposed on the president to ensure uh, this exposure is minimized. We as an employer have the same duty towards our employees. Yeah. Uh, we, have not, we have not really seen the, the uh, president or the government implement the hazardous biological agent regulations. The reason being, it's because it's a duty of an employer within South Africa. It's not his duty, but it's your duty as an employer to ensure compliance and ensure that the exposure to the COVID-19 virus is mitigated within your organization. And also, maybe just to re-emphasize, because I've worked with you for so long now, that let's go not get bogged down with this definition of employer. We, we, we should often read regulations um, based on the spirit or the purpose behind the regulation, not the letter of the law. And I learned that from you, uh, Kev. So let's not get bogged down with trying to say, well, I'm not, a, I'm not an employer of kids who come to the, to the jungle gym to, to, to play. That's not the point. The point is I understand it. And I think you are saying and have said before that it does apply to us. And this risk assessment must include all stakeholders and we must ensure that we do what we need to do. So you've got experience, you've worked in this industry for a long time. I have one more question for you. In that experience, an average estate, 400, 500 homes, uh, not that number of homes 
is is the the indicator, but just to give you a guideline. And I'll get back in uh, to lockdown. Uh, this whole setting up and the establishment and 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 as you said, the cut and paste out of the act onto a spreadsheet, the conducting of the risk assessment, the putting of those mitigation factors together, your action plans of how you're going to. Are we talking years? Are we talking months? Are we talking weeks? I know I'm putting you on the spot here and I don't want you to give a definite time because, it, you know, it all depends on how much time that we have. What is your gut feel on it? Jeff, yes. Um, if, if you would have asked me three, four weeks ago when I also got stuck in that rabbit hole of, of what we should do now, my, my opinion on you know, at that time would have been, but I do not know. I do not know how long this would take because I do not know what information to take, what information to give. Where are we with this? The moment that we regrouped and focused on this hazardous biological agent regulations, clearly identified what the main core responsibilities are. Uh, we saw that, and, and, and it has been implemented at a number of your estates within ARC, uh, over the last two, three weeks. If you set up the committee, you uh, start with your risk assessment and you uh, develop your mitigation procedures, your, uh, your training material, uh, it takes about two to three days. If you take uh, one person that's responsible, mainly responsible for this, would take two to three days. And remember, that would actually just be documenting what whatever has been said within the committees. Yes. So it should not take longer than, let's say, 20 working hours for one okay. individual. Okay. And, and, and actually, if we take a look at that, then this is not such a tall order. It's actually, it's actually doable. Yeah, and we don't have a choice, do we? I mean, it's, uh, it's what some people call the new normal, isn't it? It is, it is the new normal. And yes, just to... To get back to that other statement you made about spirit of the law, people and, and especially homeowners, visitors, uh, contractors, HOAs, should take into consideration what the purpose, and that's where we, we get to that, where you said the spirit about the law, spirit of the law is the purposive approach. People tend to read the law and they want to take the strict definition of every letter on its mm. own. That's what we call the literal approach, which is which is an important thing to do. But you are also taught throughout your studies, uh, if, if you study law, that you have to take into consideration the purposive approach. You have to see, sit yourself in the shoes or in the seat of the legislator and ask yourself, what was the intention of the legislator when drafting this, these regulations? Was it to, to, to stipulate down the rules to give people people fines and penalties no the purpose of this legislation was to ensure people are healthy and they are in, in an environment where they are safe yeah. anything that you do uh, that contributes to that value would would be seen as 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 legislation because they they put their duty on you to say you must go and determine what is reasonably practicable for you to do Cool. What a what a beautiful way of dealing with that question and of wrapping up the discussion with Kevin today. Um, Kev, just quickly give us your email address. Kevin at universalitysa.com. All right, Kev, it's been a pleasure chatting to you and um, we'll talk to you uh, very, very soon. Well done.